sa to ma sa da ga ma ya ta ma so ho ma ha ham jo ho ti ga ma ya prithyor mam amritam ga ma ya avir avir mai hi rudra yate dakshinam mukaha te namaham pa initiam om lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness unto light lead us from death to immortality and reach us through and through ourselves and evermore protect us from ignorance by thy sweet compassionate face <clears throat> so my subject this morning is the inner light and i'm going to begin by talking about the light and then we're going to talk about the inner light all of you know that in hinduism there are thousands of gods and goddesses and in vedanta we would say that they are all different aspects of one supreme person the ruler of this universe each one of these aspects of god has their own name and form each one has met one or many temples built in their honor temples and associated with them no doubt some holy festival special time of the year when hundreds of devotees will come together and sing the name and glories of god but to understand our subject this morning we have to go far back in time into the vedic period before the origin of the conception of a personal god the vedic peoples used to worship light they worship they used to worship light beings they're called devas and the deva is a sanskrit word of course it's a come from an old indo european root div which means divinity and so that's a god a deva is a shining being a divine div means to shine like a light they used to worship the dawn and the lightning and the stars and the sky and the moon and the sun and of course the sacrificial fire which carried the offerings upward to heaven these vedic peoples were called aryans literally translated the children of the light let's give you an example of one of these vedic gods and our best example no best example is surya deva you can see him today shining in the sky if we were to imagine if we had no concept of anything 
divine or any concept of God, soul, God, and religion. Way back in the origin of primordial history, if we had no idea, what was the best thing that we could conceive of would be an image of God. Well, certainly it's got to be the sun. The sun is the, the source of all of our light. It's the source of all of the heat on the earth and the vital energy. It's absorbed by the plants that we eat and it allows us to live and to grow. And all of the energy in the world, wind, but what about wind energy? Well, we have solar energy, but what about wind energy? Well, why does wind move? Just because the sun illumines the planet in different dimensions, different temperatures, and so the air moves from one area to another. And why do we speak of, well, what about hydroelectric power? What about electricity? Well, that comes from, what are the flowing rivers turn the turbines? But why do those rivers flow? It's all part of the water cycle, which is all part of the great heat water cycle that allows this planet to live governed and regulated by the sun. So that is why even today, in modern India, you can see on the banks of the river Ganges, in early morning, orthodox Hindus come down and wade into the Ganges River, and they look up at the sun, holding their, their hands like that, and they recite the Gayatri mantra, ancient mantra from the Rig Veda. We could call it the Lord's Prayer of Hinduism. Now light, light is itself a natural metaphor for divinity. It's also a natural metaphor for knowledge and consciousness. Because just as light removes darkness, so also knowledge removes ignorance. And ignorance is the source of all of our suffering. This is why we're interested in knowledge. This is why, this is why you're here this morning. Because this is the Vedanta society. Vedanta means knowledge. This is the knowledge society. And it's all about attaining that knowledge which removes our suffering. All suffering is due to ignorance. So we look around, we see people all around us in the world, a whole spectrum of people from good to people to very bad. Everybody is the same. Everybody is climbing that mountain to reach the immortal city of Brahman. And everyone in their mind and heart are trying to do, they're trying to attain the good. That's the Plato, that's the Greek philosopher Plato. All of us, everyone in history, struggling to try to attain the good. But what is the good? Well, that depends on your level of consciousness, your level of knowledge. And if you are at a very low level of consciousness, a low, very low vibrational level of understanding, then your conception of the good will be radically different from the conception of another person who's higher up in the spectrum. Both of you want the same thing, but it manifests itself in radically different ways. Now in Vedanta, we talk about two kinds of knowledge. There's the lower knowledge, 
and there's the higher knowledge. Both of these remove ignorance and thus are of value to us in our life. But it's only the higher knowledge that is the knowledge of soul, God, and religion that is superconscious, direct knowledge of the transcendental reality which can remove spiritual ignorance that is your knowledge of your own true self and thus this is our a spiritual aspirant this is our highest ideal to attain that higher knowledge it's only through that superconscious direct knowledge of our own true nature that the ignorance can be removed that is our awareness that is our forgetfulness of our true nature the atman and it makes sense that knowledge would be so prioritized let's say that you were going to give a class and you came to the classroom and uh, well maybe it was eight o'clock at night it's dark outside you open the door and it's pitch dark inside many people have come in but they're all stumbling around they can't find their chairs they're bumping into tables they're bumping into each other oh it's complete chaos what difficulties now you can think well what should I do well <laughs> Maybe you would think uh, I would just fall on my knees and worship and pray to God. Please help me to remove some of this confusion. Maybe I would cross my legs, sit down in meditation posture and begin to meditate. Or maybe begin to go out and serve people and serve the, the poor and the homeless come back to the room still dark still the same problem obviously the only rational thing to do would be to turn on the light the light removes the darkness and it's the darkness that is our problem everything straightens out everything gets quickly put into order Once upon a time, this is a story from the, there was a Swami who came to America in 1902, just after the passing of Swami Vivekananda. He was in fact inspired by Swami Vivekananda. His name was Swami Ram Tirtha. And we have in our library uh, his collection of his works called In the Woods, of God realization. He was a great teacher of Indian non-dualism. A lot of anecdotes and Indian stories in those old books, which maybe you wouldn't see somewhere in the library. In any case, he tells about a village in which there were people living there, and they found that they had nearby there was a there was a cave. Just a it's a huge cave that is the mouth of the cave, a big, dark, black, threatening mouth, kind of was overlooking the village. And people would walk by and they would avoid that place and they began to story started growing up about what is this? What is this demon darkness that so don't go up there? Little boys would go up there and throw stones some other one would throw maybe a sharpened stick once in a while some older person would go up there with a spear hurl it into that darkness nothing happened and people began to become more and more uneasy more and more unsettled and one day a traveling a boy came by traveling that way and he was just seeking his fortune. 
And he walked by and he said, oh, hello, what do you do? What, what is here? You heard about this cave? He said, oh, well, let's go look at that. He went up this cave and he thought, well, let's go in there. He went over and he lit a torch. And holding that torch, he walked into the cave. And behind him, the villagers, kind of with great trepidation, step by step, they followed him in. He looked there with a torch, showing the walls and everything, the big the cavern, cavern as they walked down and down. What did they see? They got way down there, they saw a big box that had been hidden there for hundreds of years. It was like a big treasure box. Oh, they were so happy. They were all, everybody, of course, the boy now became a hero. He had defeated the demon darkness. And so that's kind of the teaching of the Vedanta philosophy. The light is the divinity. That's which what we, what, that is what we seek. That divinity. Now we've equated, we've equated light with divinity and with knowledge and with consciousness, of course. Consciousness is just students of Vedanta. Consciousness is just knowledge with a capital K. It's what innates the source of knowledge. And um, in the old Upanishadic texts, in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, the great forest Upanishad, there's an account of the king Janaka, who was a famous king in ancient times. He was a spiritual aspirant, seeker of knowledge. And he came to the ashrama of the sage Yagyavalkya. And there he had some questions for the sage. And he asked him, O Yagyavalkya, what is it that serves as a light for man? And Yagyavalkya looked at him and he said, well, it is the sun, O king. It is by the light of the sun that a man gets up and goes out, works, and returns. Mm, quite so, Yagyavalkya, said Janaka. But you know, what about when the sun has set? Then what serves as a, night for, a light for man? Well, then the moon indeed is his light, O king. For the light of the moon, he goes out, and he works, and he returns. Quite so, Yagyavalkya said the Janaka, this is the dialogue. Thousands of years ago, 4,000 years ago, they're asking this, di this is a dialogue, in the forest ashrama. But when the sun is set and the moon is set, then what serves as a light for man? Well, then the fire, indeed, is his light, O king. Because by the light of fire, man can go out, and work in return. Quite so, Yagyavalkya, said Janaka. But when the moon is set and the, well, the sun is set and the moon set, the fire has gone out. Then what serves as a light for man? And Yagyavalkya said, well, then it is speech, O king, is the light for man. For the light of speech, that is hearing others voices and their directions. We can go out and work and return. Quite so, Yagyavalkya, said Janaka. But when the sun is set, the moon is set, the fire has gone out, and the speech is quiet, then what serves as a light for man? And then Yagyavalkya gives him the famous teaching there, then it is the self, indeed, is his light, O king. Or the, by the light of the Atman, that is the true self. It's by that light of consciousness, which is your true nature, that enables us to live. 
And so we have this ancient dialogue, which is kind of um, understandable to us. We're discussing the same subject this morning. We're talking about light, and we equated light with divinity and with consciousness and with knowledge. And now Yagyavalkya has equated it with the self that is our true self. And, um, well, that's quite removed from what we would call light. Because when we think of light, think about when you are walk around during the day, you see the trees, the flowers, the birds are singing, and you can see everything because of the light of another. That is the light of the sun. But what happens when you go to sleep at night? There too, you find yourself, you wake up in another world, you walk around, you see there's trees, there's other people there, birds are singing, you can hear the voices, you can, all that is there. But how, where does the, where did the light come from? See, there's no light, there's no lamp inside. If your eyes are closed, you can say, well, psych, some psychologists would say, well, you see, it's just a memory of the waking light. In the waking, in the waking state, we record light, and it goes into our, and so we have a, a recall. Just like a photograph of a tree, it's encoded, the light that, that illumined that tree is encoded in our memory. But now, wait a minute, you think about that, that doesn't make any sense either, because if you take a photograph of a tree, during the sunshine, and you go to look at that tree uh, uh, in a dark room, you can't see it. And so it requires, it still it does require something else. It requires another light. And what about, why, why stop with sleep? Because in de dreamless sleep, when there is no mind, when there's only awareness of nothingness, then too, there is no external light. And therefore, what is it that illumines and allows us to know it's only our consciousness? That's why the, light, the meaning of light, metaphorical meaning here, is light and consciousness. And in the Upanishad, It says there, Natatra Surya Ubhati, the Chandra Tarakam, Nema Vidhu Bhanti Kutoyo Magni, Tameva Bhantam Anubhati Sarvam, Tasya Bhasa Sarvam Vidam Vibhati. That's an old verse, and it says, The sun does not shine there, nor the moon, nor the lightning, nor the stars, nor any earthly light. The only thing that shines there, that means, in the highest state of consciousness and samadhi, is your own consciousness, your own self, your own Atman. And I quote to you the Sanskrit verse. You may say, why bother to quote the Sanskrit verse? Well, um, in the monastery, we were required to memorize those verses. And so occasionally I think, well, hey, I know some of them. I know a lot of the important ones. Why don't I just recite them? So you can hear them too, just for your curiosity. So we're talking here about light. In deep sleep, there's no external light. And therefore, it must be our own consciousness. And so the whole thing here is kind of, it's a call to what is the deeper teaching here, is kind of a call to introspection. Turning our eyes now to look inward towards the self within. 
Now, you remember on a previous occasion, we talked about the Brahmin widow. She was a seamstress. And one day, as she sat in her chair, sewing by the afternoon light, time passed, unloading. The sun set, and it became dark, and she dropped her sewing needle. What to do? Well, she set her work aside, got up, went over, took her shawl, wrapped it around her shoulders, went out the door, down the steps, down the little lane of which her cottage was, just as he came to the main street, turned on the street, walked down there a little ways until she came to a bright street lamp. And there she began looking around under that lamp. And, uh, well, it wasn't long before a patrol, patrolling policeman came by that way. And he said, excuse me, madam, have you lost something? She said, yes, sir, I have. I've lost my sewing needle. Oh, I'm so sorry, said the policeman. Here, let me, let me help you. He looked around. He got down on his hands and knees. He was looking all around there under the uh, lamppost. He was like, what, 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 you, are you sure that you lost it here? We don't see it anywhere. She said, well, here? No, sir, I didn't lose I, I lost it back in my house. <laughs> she said, well, why are you looking for it here? Well, she said, this is where the light is. <laughs> so that's kind of our condition. We think, well, what a foolish woman. But not at all. We're in exactly the same condition. Because what we seek, what do we seek? Where do we seek what we want in the external world? And so we're in exactly the same condition. We've forgotten the teachings of the saints and sages of the Upanishads, which is calling us to an inward search And we're engaged in a futile process. This is Maya. In any case, in the, in the Kata Upanishad, it asks a famous question there, fourth chapter. Kind of an interesting question. You know, when you think about enlightenment, you think about people doing spiritual practice of whatever way you conceive of it. And... Um, he would, uh, you'd think that there must have been somebody, if we were to trace the lineage of mankind all the way back to the original, there must have been a first person who got the bright idea, you know, to look within himself, to close his eyes, because we're born with our senses turned outwards. See and hear. Who, some guy had the first brilliant idea, hey, wait a minute, this is not working. Why don't I close my eyes and look within? He was the first one. After that, the traditions grew. The call to introspection. Somehow he heard it. Sri Ramakrishna tells about the man who was an inveterate smoker. And one night he was, he woke up and it was one in the morning and he had a bright idea, I want to have a smoke. And he turned over and he reached, he had his little hand rolled, the beady cigarettes, but he didn't have any matches. Oh no. He was frantic. Well, why not just wait till tomorrow morning? No, he can't. He's a smoker. So what does he do? Well, he gets up. He got dressed, went downstairs. It turns out there was a, a lantern burning in the window. He picked up that lantern, went out the front door, like the Brahmin widow, down the street to the next door. Knock, knock, knock. Here it is, one in the morning. He's what, knocking on the front door of his neighbor. And, 
Well, the windows open upstairs. Neighbor looks out. What? What are you doing there? What do you want? He said, oh, sir, sorry, sorry, sorry to trouble you. Said, I need a light for my smoke. And the neighbor said, well, you fool. How, how could you disturb, disturb everyone there in the middle of the night? Don't you see that you have a lighted lantern in your hand? Yeah, see, he never noticed that. And so he had to kind of hearken that call to introspection. You don't have to go next door. So let's talk here about the inner light. We're coming this morning out of the framework of the great spiritual practice of Raja Yoga, that is the great path of meditation, turning within ourselves, looking within to find the God and the divinity within us. The source book for all forms of meditation is Patanjali's uh, Raja Yoga Sutras. And this, these Yoga Sutras are really the science of concentration and focus, inward focus. And the highest application of this science is to focus and concentrate your mind on the soul. The Purusha, it's called. The Purusha, that is yourself. That's the highest application. To realize your true nature. Now that, the way, and then potentially has now the commentary saying, oh, wait a minute. The soul is infinite. The soul is the spirit. It has no name. It has no form. It has no shape or color or size. How could you even think about it? How could you visualize it and contemplate it in, in, in your mind? Your mind couldn't grasp it. That's true. That's why when we begin with the practice of Raja Yoga, we have to begin with a symbol that is a representation of the spirit. You can't think about the spirit, but you can think about a representation of the spirit. And Patanjali gives us many different options. And one of the most famous is that of a lamp burning in a windless place. And he quotes there from the Upanishads, Angusta, Matra, Purusho, Jyotir, Ivad, Humaka. That means a light the size of a thumb. Uh, the light of lights of that small size, that it's burning like a flame without smoke. That's the idea. So this is one of his recommendations, that if you, were to rec if you want to meditate on your own soul, you choose a, a visual a representation, a symbol, and focus your mind and your concentration on that. Now, when you were to do that, that is a general rule. You may think, OK, if I were to meditate on that inward light. Now, wait a minute. You see, because it's not as if you have an actual lantern or an electric light bulb inside your chest. So don't think that when you begin to meditate that you have to focus and concentrate. You kind of have to straining your eyes your mind's eye, you're straining your mind's eye to, in order to see that light. But that's not the idea. The idea is not to, to see anything. The light is a, a representation. It's a symbol. It's like looking at the cross for a Christian, maybe. It reminds us. It has meaning. It has something that it will reveal to us. And that revelation only will take place when we are able to focus and concentrate our minds with the requisite presence 
of consciousness and attention. And having done that, we will, the light is self-luminous. What does that light mean? It just means yourself. And you will become aware of yourself. That's a light. Well, we can think about it in different ways. Patanjali gives us other pratikas and pratimas, that is, different kinds of symbols and pictures and things to meditate upon. But our subject this morning is the light, the inner light. And we're trying to figure out what does that mean? Now, to sit there and look at a light. Um, I'll quote to you some verses from uh, a song that was written by Hank Williams, Shakespeare of country music. He wrote a song that became a gospel standard and was recorded by many different artists. And the title was, I Saw the Light. Let's try to just think of a few of those verses. We're trying to figure out what does that mean to see the light? What does that mean? That's what we're trying to figure out. In the first verse there, he says something, I wandered alone and uh, in a world full of sin, I wouldn't let my poor savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night and praised the Lord. I saw the light. That's a pretty good verse, you think? Yeah, okay. What does this mean? This is kind of like a vision. The saint, see, has a vision of Jesus, a luminous vision. Yeah, that's a good, kind of a good interpretation of uh, what this means to see the light, to meditate on the inner light. In the second verse there, he says, like a blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears I claimed for my own. And then, like the blind man, that God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. Okay, well, that's pretty good, too. Because it's kind of like an idea of a, a blind man. That's very Vedantic. We're blind. We can't see our true nature. We've lost touch with our own inner self. We're like blind people. We need to have someone to reveal to us, remove our blindness. That's what it means. To see the light is to remove your, to remove your blindness. And the third verse, he said, well, like a fool, I wandered astray, but straight is the gate and narrow the way. And now I've traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. Okay, well, good. There's a different interpretation. In other words, the light bulb went on. I realize I'm going the wrong way in life. I've got to get out the straight and narrow. I've got to give up my evil ways, <laughs> turn over a new leaf. That's seeing the light. So like that, we can kind of understand metaphorically, symbolically, the idea of an inner light. So we had a light and we had a natural association with divinity, natural association with knowledge, natural association with consciousness, with a capital C, which is knowledge, a natural association um, with the self, that is our true nature. And we've turned the mind and attention and focus within to see if we can discover our true nature, our true self. 
And so this is the purpose of the Vedanta philosophy. The Vedanta philosophy in all its aspects is all about enlightenment, to achieve enlightenment. Now, there are different ways to do that. This morning we talked here about meditating on the inner light. But enlightenment just means illumination. Our goal here and purpose of our lives is to become illumined. And why do we want to become illumined? Because illumination, light, removes darkness. And darkness is the cause of suffering. And therefore, if we can, if, if we can become enlightened, then we will achieve the suffering. The suffering means what? The search, the inner emptiness, the, the want, the loss that we feel, all that we mean here by, by suffering in the living our lives. We want to achieve that sense of inner self-fulfillment that comes through enlightenment. Let me close here with a story. By there was a man who was a farmer, and he um, well, his sons were grown. His family was gone. He lived alone in the big manor house of this estate. And uh, he'd grown later on in life. He was all alone. House was empty. He felt like he needed something to fill up his life. And so he called, set out, summoned, each one of his three sons, they came from afar. He said, sons, I'm, uh, I'm going to make talk here about your inheritance. I've decided here to give the inheritance of this entire estate to only one of you. And that is to the one of you that exhibits the most deepest understanding how we can bring some fulfillment in life. This is what the father wanted. Tired of living alone in this empty house, he wanted a sense of fulfillment. Well, the very next day, the eldest son, he pulls up in front of the house, and here he is wagon after wagon of hay, it goes out, pitchfork, came in, workmen came in, and they moved all the furniture. It was a huge mess, but they filled up the whole living room, kitchen, bedrooms, everything with huge bales, piles of hay. And when the father returned home, well, he was surprised. He said, wow, well, very, that's cre very creative. Yeah, it certainly is. Everything's full of hay, all right. But he didn't give him that satisfaction he wanted. And so they cleared everything out of there. And soon the second eldest, the second son, he appeared. And he came with strings of horses. He lined those horses up in front of the house, and one by one, he led the horses themselves into the house. And he put a huge horse in the kitchen and then a living room and the bathroom and the bedrooms. And the father came home. And he looked at his soul. <laughs> well, you're right. You filled the house. But let's see what the youngest son will do. And so they cleared everything away and they got rid of all those ho uh, horses and all that hay. And the father went upstairs and he was fell asleep at night. In the middle of the night, the youngest son came quietly in. He went into the living room, didn't touch any of the furniture, just sat there quietly. And he pulled out a candle and he lit the candle. And then he called his father and 
the father came downstairs, and what did he see? Oh, yes, he saw everywhere. Everything was neat, clean, just as it was before. And yet it was everything was bathed in a kind of a sweet and golden light. And there was his son seated there. And so he felt kind of, yeah, the good sense of fulfillment. That's our purpose, to achieve that sense of enlightenment, of illumination that comes from realizing our true nature.